being none, it is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on 18 July 2020 of Colin Victor James Mason, a senator for the state of New South Wales from 1978 to 1987. I call the leader of the government in the Senate. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of uh, Senator Colin Victor James Mason. Leave is granted, Senator Corman. I thank the Senate. Uh, I move that the Senate records uh, its sorrow at the death on 18 July 2020 of Colin Victor James Mason, former Senator for New South Wales, places on record its appreciation for his service to the Parliament and the nation and tenders its sympathy to his family in their bereavement. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Colin Mason uh, lived a long and remarkable life. <clears throat> he was a <clears throat> respected journalist, author, politician <clears throat> and family man. Colin was the ABC's first foreign correspondent to Asia and one of the first Australian Democrats elected to the Australian Senate. His life was full of uh, accomplishments stretching from New Zealand to Australia and Southeast Asia through the halls of Parliament House and uh, into this chamber. Colin was born in Auckland on 28 October 1926. He studied journalism at the University of New Zealand Victoria College in Wellington. Upon graduating, he started his career as a journalist where he would meet his future wife Nancy Williamson. In 1950, like many New Zealanders who cross the Tasman each year, Colin and Nancy made the journey to Australia and settled in Brisbane. Colin worked for the Sydney Morning Herald before joining the ABC as a radio and television journalist and documentary producer. In 1956, he became the ABC's first foreign correspondent in Asia, establishing an office in Singapore and pioneering ABC radio in the region. His time in Southeast Asia coincided with a period of enormous change and in increasing turmoil. There was civil unrest and many countries had forced the withdrawal of European colonial rule with communism slowly gaining a foothold in parts of Asia. Colin spoke of his time in Southeast Asia as fascinating, demanding and at times slightly dangerous. But it was always interesting and because of the amount of change always newsworthy. He was considered a significant commentator and recognised expert on Asian history and an early advocate for Australia's engagement with our region. Colin published a number of novels and extensive materials on the Southeast Asia region, including Hostage in 1973, which went on to sell 200,000 copies worldwide, a major, major accomplishment. After 14 years with the IBC, Colin moved his family to the Blue Mountains to spend more time with them and focus on his writing. However, he took a keen interest in politics and in the early 1970s, Colin joined the Australia Party, running as a Senate candidate in the 1975 election. And while he was unsuccessful in 1975, he would get another opportunity a couple of years later. Politics can be like that. In 1977, Colin ran again, this time as a Senate candidate for the newly formed Australian Democrats. As one of the founding members of the Australian Democrats and vice president of the party, Colin was successful in securing a seat in the Australian Senate. And on 1 July 1978, Colin entered this chamber as one of the first senators to represent the Australian Democrats alongside former Liberal Senator Don Chip. By 1931, the number of Democrats rose to five, and by 1985, it rose again to seven, giving them the balance of power in the Senate. During this time, during his time in the Senate, uh, Colin was very vocal on a number of issues, including the importance of participatory democracy, environmental issues and foreign affairs. He was a strong advocate for bilateral relations between Australia and China, promoting peace and prosperity even after retiring from politics. He took part in the first Australian parliamentary delegation to the People's Republic of China in 1985 and upon his return noted that China was full of great trade opportunities for Australia. After leaving Parliament in 1987, Colin returned to his passion for writing. He published a number of fictional and non-fictional novels, taking inspiration from his experiences in Southeast Asia and his time in the Australian Parliament. His love of writing was something he passed on to his sons, 
who have also published a number of books. Colin was a family man. He greatly enjoyed spending time with his children and grandchildren, taking family vacations, exploring the bushland around his Blue Mountains property and sailing around Pitwater. Colin was, always, uh, Colin, Colin was also an avid body surfer and even in his 90s could still be spotted riding waves around the Northern Beaches area. Colin died aged 93 on Saturday, July 18, after battling ill health. His wife, Nancy, had passed in 2001, and he leaves three children, Mark, Rosemary, and Matthew, as well as five grandchildren. On behalf of the Australian Government and the Australian Senate, I extend to Colin's loved ones our sincerest condolences. May he rest in peace. Senator Keneally. Thank you very much. I rise on behalf of the opposition to acknowledge the passing of former New South Wales Senator Colin J Victor James Mason, one of the founding members of the Australian Democrats. He passed away in July at the age of 93. From the outset, I wish to convey the opposition's condolences to the relatives and friends of Mr Mason. He started his life across the ditch, born in Auckland, New Zealand on the 28th of October 1926. And having studied journalism in Wellington, he established a career as a journalist before moving to Australia in 1950. He married his wife, Nancy Williamson, in 1952, with whom he had three children. In 1956, almost 65 years ago, the ABC set up its first foreign bureau in Singapore to cover Southeast Asia. The man responsible for the establishment of the bureau and ABC's first permanent foreign correspondent was Colin Mason. Armed with a large 16 mm spring-wound Bell and Howell movie camera and what he described as a horrendously big and unreliable tape recorder, he was the first of many ABC foreign correspondents. Spreading from Burma to Japan, Mason said the newly found bureau was always interesting and because of the tumult of change, always newsworthy. On a good day, it would take 24 hours by airmail to return the footage captured by Mason to Australian newsrooms. Mason remarked, we became quite a big deal in television when they began syndicating vision across the globe to the ABC, the BBC, and the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. As the demand for news, particularly TV news, expanded, the Southeast Asian Bureau staff grew from just Mason to upwards of 16 people. And in 2006, to mark the 50th anniversary of the ABC's first overseas bureau, Mason told Fran Kelly on ABC Radio National, and I quote, the great thing about 1956 was it was a tremendous goodwill towards Australia. Everywhere I went, I found friends and people willing to help me and everybody was interested in Australia. And it was interesting that the biggest radio audience the ABC had at that time was actually not in Australia, but in Asia, and that would be people who listened to Radio Australia. It had tremendous influence, he said. Regrettably since then, these shortwave services have since ceased, along with Australia's reach into the region. Now, Mason covered the defeat of the French at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu in 1954, the first time a European army had ever been defeated by a guerrilla army and the forerunner to the United States involvement in the Vietnam War. He described his experiences in Southeast Asia as, quote, fairly hairy from time to time, particularly dur during the Malayan emergency. He shared a story with Frank Kelly about that, too. He said, they had a situation where you drove around Malaya by car. You weren't allowed to carry food, money, or even typing paper with you in case a communist terrorist got it. You weren't allowed to stop your car except within the village perimeters, which had barbed wire right around them. So I was approaching the barbed wire one evening of a village called Sange Siput, and just in front of me was an army jeep, an open jeep with a guy driving it, an English one. And just as we started to approach, I was right behind him, his windscreen just disappeared from machine gun fire on the roadside. And I thought, well, this is it. I could see he was bleeding and the jeep slowed down. We could see the gate to the village about 100 meters ahead and it was just a matter of pushing on. 
and I think he could see in his mare that I was behind him, and those seconds went very, very slowly, I can tell you, until I finally got inside that base. Following his 14-year career at the ABC, Mason moved on to politics, becoming a founding member of the Australian Democrats. He was pivotal in getting the Australia Party to ally with the newly founded Democrats, taking the lead on party structure, rules, and policies behind the scenes. He was elected to Parliament as a Senator for New South Wales, alongside the party's first leader, Don Chip, in 1977. He was re-elected in 1983, and just a year later in 1984, thanks to the double dissolution of 1983. During his time in the Senate, the power of the Australian Democrats rose from two senators in 1977 to five in 1981 and then seven in 1985. And Mason was there as the party gained an influence over the legislative agenda and eventually the balance of power in the Senate in their own right. Now Mason was the deputy leader of the Australian Democrats from 1978 to 1985 before becoming their spokesperson on foreign affairs from 1985 to the end of his term. In 1982, Mason formed the Parliamentary Nuclear Disarmament Group, acknowledging the enormous difficulties in achieving this objective, but that all people of goodwill must at least exert their efforts in that direction. It was during the 1980s that Mason became one of the main agitators for and supporters of Lindy Chamberlain. He raised concerns about how the process had and had not been followed by the courts. He pushed to establish a commission of inquiry into the Chamberlain case. And he did this out of a sense of justice, compassion, and the fair go. And of course, Chamberlain's case was ultimately reviewed. Colin Mason will be most likely known for his efforts to fight for and protect the environment. Of the nine private senators' bills Mason introduced, a majority dealt with environmental issues, and he was a staunch advocate for renewable energy industries. His private senator's bill, the World Heritage Properties Protection Bill 1982, was the only one of his led bills to pass the Senate, with the support of the then Labor opposition. And it was easily the most influential. The bill would have prevented the Tasmanian state government from constructing the Franklin River Dam but it never progressed through the then liberal-controlled House of Representatives. It did, however, pave the way for the newly elected Hawke government to pass legislation in 1983, which had the same intent as Mason's bill and ultimately prevented the construction of the dam. Having ne never met Colin Mason myself, I take this opportunity to share the condolences of those he did work alongside, support and share political allegiance. I spoke with the former leader of the Australian Democrats, Ms. Natasha Stott Despoja, and she said, I won't forget his support of me and other Democrats he considered upheld the party's traditional role of listening to their membership. I remember him as a kind man, a clever and worldly man. He was a pioneering environmentalist. He is one of the reasons we have World, Her world Heritage legislation and a protected Franklin River Dam, excuse me, a protected Franklin River. He was ahead of his time in his understanding of the dangers of climate change. I also spoke with another former leader of the Australian Democrats, now turned Greens and former Senator Andrew Bartlett. He said Mason showed people that the Democrats were more than just, just Don Chip. According to Andrew Bartlett, Mason was the calm, kind, and considered ba balance to Chip's energy and enthusiasm. He was direction compared to Chip, who went 10 directions at once. Mason showed Australians that the Australian Democrats were broader than just one person in Don Chip. Don Chip, of course, was a remarkable parliamentarian. And after he retired as the first leader of the Australian Democrats, Mason could have run for leader himself. Instead, he looked for the opportunity to encourage and support Janine Haynes, who then became the first female federal parliamentary leader of an Australian political party in 1986. Mason retired from the Senate in 1987 when yet another double dissolution election was called. And post-politics, he returned to be a full-time writer. 
Before and after politics, Mason wrote a total of 11 books, including A Short History of Asia, The 2030 Spike, Countdown to Global Catastrophe, and novels, including Hostage, Copperhead Creek, and Northern Approaches. And while I'm sure Mason may have been at times surprised about the reach of his authorship, I'm certain he would have been particularly astounded, Mr. President, to discover a copy of his book, The 2030 Spike, was one of the 39 English language books found in the Pakistan-based compound where Osama bin Laden was killed in 2011. Now I will finish with the words of Colin Mason himself that he shared in his final speech to the Senate on the 28th of May, 1987, some 33 years ago. He said, I would like to begin by placing on record my sincere appreciation for the friendships and the education the last nine years in this place have given me. Being in this place is a very educational process, and I'm sure that all of us here find that to be the case. I will leave this parliament not with any spirit of cynicism, but rather a feeling that the issues and problems that this parliament encounters are difficult. Nothing in this world is simple. We today acknowledge the service of Colin Mason to our Parliament and to our country, as well as to the Australian Democrats. And as we farewell Mr. Mason, I again express the opposition's condolences to his family, his friends, and including those at the ABC. I ask honourable senators to join in a moment of silence to signify assent to the motion. The motion is carried. Senators, it is also with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on the 16th of June of former Senator John Madigan of Victoria, a senator from 2011 to 2016. Um, a time for that condolence motion is in discussion with his family and it will be later this year. Thanks, Senators.